Hello, welcome to Hot Issues. I'm Stephen Enti. In 2018, the agricultural sector expanded by 4.8% against a growth rate of 6.1% in 2017. Despite that, the share of agric to GDP declined from 21.1% in 2017 uh, compared to 19.7, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, in uh, 2018. Agriculture, the agricultural sector has faced several challenges. Investors in the sector actually have faced issues like stiff competition from uh, cheap products and access to ready-made markets uh, and all of that. But how can we overcome this to ensure that the Ghanaian develops appetite for locally produced agricultural products? What are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? Uh, I have with me uh, today uh, Dr. Michael Abu Sakara, who is an agroeconomist, to help us read in between the lines. Uh, thanks for uh, coming. I am, I am very fascinated when I hear uh, stories of successes of governments uh, planting for food and jobs program, which was instituted in 2017 with the view of uh, discouraging a lot of our young people from going into the big cities for non-existent jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, against this backdrop and uh, claims, government claims of success, and what we see today, uh, which government fails to acknowledge that it's glut, how do you assess the potential of agriculture to our economy, and what have we done right? Well, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. I think, first of all, I comment on these issues as uh, somebody who has spent a long time in international agricultural development, uh, and also from my training as an agronomist and somebody who has uh, worked with uh, other people uh, focusing on rural development and how that can be used to spare overall national growth. Uh, I think the two key issues that we should take note of, uh, one, is the overall patterns in the changes relative to the entire economy. And the other, of course, are the year-on-year -year increases within the sector and how that relates to other sectors. Uh, now, when we talk about the overall pattern, of course, we don't need to reiterate the fact that agriculture has significant potential. It is the backbone of the economy. We all know that. It has been contributing a significant percentage of GDP. Even at some time, it was more than 50%. Now it's coming down to around 30%, 29.7%. Now, there's a pattern there. The question is, what is happening? Is it good or bad? The other issue in relation to that pattern is, why is it not contributing not just more, but also, why is it not contributing in a more a transformative way in terms of how it affects other sectors, uh, the added value industry, etc. So now looking at things as they stand now, we generally tend to discuss agriculture in terms of what is happening in production. Uh, we and that, that is wrong or short-sighted? Well, uh, it is not the whole of the elephant. <laughs> it is just a part of it. There are so many other parts of it that are left uncovered because we focus on the impact in production because that is where we are at. But as we make progress up the value chain, you know, and the interventions change, to reflect that we are actually trying to address other issues of the value chain other than production, then we begin to see the impact on the other subsectors, uh, other sectors as well. Now, as we stand now, it is true that with the focus that we have had in agriculture, you mean a focus program like planting for food and jobs, working on key principal things like seed sector, getting the seed out. There has been some impact in you know production. Fertilizer production. Fertilizer, etc. You, you've seen it. I mean, but that is not new. It has happened before. before. The real issue, which I was alluding to, is how do you carry this growth into the value added phase? And how do you begin to impact on the other sectors? That is where the real So you're thinking is that are. as a country we've been hovering around the dynamics of increasing production or not and losing sight of the other aspects of the value chain? Well, I don't think that people have lost sight of it. It's just that we have not addressed them specifically. It's either because, you know, we don't have sufficient resources to address them or we perhaps haven't had the uh, discipline and strength of mind to say, okay, this is done, 
let us now focus on doing this. We can't be all things to all people or all things to every sector at all at once. And I think that is basically where we keep uh, having a problem because at the end of the day, you track the contributions in the agricultural sector. For example, this year, we have 1.65% of the total budget going to the agricultural sector. And agriculture is bringing in more than 29% of so uh, the total GDP. So budgetary allocation insufficient, inadequate? Well, it, it's not just a matter of insufficiency. It's a question of what are you going to do with it and what is actually needed? Uh, because if you're going to just focus on production still... So you're thinking I mean, that government is not benchmarking uh, the commitment of funding to the relevant areas that are needed to uh, affect the entire value chain well, rather uh, than uh, increase production? Well, what I'm saying is that our overall strategy must be comprehensive and it must go beyond production. As we sit now, you will list most all the interventions you find that most of them are related to production. And that is where we need another kind of investment. And I think that is where we're not used to these so let's other talk kinds about that of investment. Kind of investment. These kind? kinds of investment largely require intervention from the private sector and enabling the private sector, not just in access to machinery and working capital, but also in the policy changes that you need to make them competitive. So in don't their just own bring market. the private sector into investment, but bring them along in the decision making and the policies that are expected to change well, the industry. Well, in bringing them along, you have to listen to what they are saying. Government is not listening. And is that make what you're no. I'm not. I'm saying that not only do you have to listen to what they're saying, but you also have to make those changes that reflect how the private sector truly works. I want us to focus a little bit on the rice and the challenge we in the media see as glut. Government uh, fails to acknowledge that that is glut. I want you to tell me in, from your expertise and experience, what you think went wrong from day one? Could we have reversed what happened? I mean, Fumbusi farmers are, are crying of lack of available markets and their produce are going bad. Government is promising construction of warehouses and storage facilities scattered across specific uh, parts of the country and all of that. These are, have been, uh, government have said all of that. But where exactly do you think the policy went wrong? Well, I, I think first of all, agriculture is a dynamic process. We are not in any way going to suggest that things could not have been done to prevent uh, the current situation. But the question was, at that material point in time when things should be done, that was one year ago, not now. And in one year ago, when you allocated the budget for agriculture, was it sufficient to address some of these issues in terms of... So you're saying that if you're addressing it now, then uh, the solution is ad hoc. Well, the point is, is it planned in the scheme of things for you to do that? And what I'm saying basically is that some of those things government can do, some of those things government cannot do. Uh, government cannot be giving them loans to go and buy mills. But government can ensure that uh, the financing schemes are tilted towards supporting agriculture so that these people can get the financing to have those small scale mills in those areas. Now, when you have money which is running away from agriculture because there's other places for it to run to, mm -hmm. like tea bills. Yeah. That is not helping it to come into the area where people can get funny, money for these kinds of things. So policy is very important. And it's, you, you can't take money from the government budget and say, here, go and set up a, you know, small a, a small mill. Mm. But you can say that, look, uh, governor, look into this situation. Uh, if agriculture, if the lending rates are above, you know, 20%, uh, these people are not going to take this money to go and, you know, uh, buy these mills. Because let's look at that financial model. How long will it take them to, to, to pay for it? And there are certain profits, margins in agriculture. We cannot suddenly increase them ad finitum. <laughs> you know, they have to, you have to work within them. So it's based on the cost of money. 
And the cost of money is not determined by the farmer. Yeah. It's determined by the policy makers. Is it your view that <laughs> the duopoly of NDC and PP uh, have not done well for the agricultural sector? No, I think that they could have done more. Uh, certainly, the periods where you know, we almost neglected the agricultural sector. And that's why when I say that, I'm glad to see the focus now uh, with uh, interventions coming. There may be problems with the implementation of those, uh, you know, interventions. But the issue is that it is focused enough to start dragging money into the agriculture uh, uh, budget. But that money itself is not enough to do the things that you need to do if agriculture is going to be a pivotal point of how to change the architecture of your economy and at the levels that allow us to be competitive. Because we have certain ceilings of productivity increase <laughs> and we cannot go beyond those ceilings just from naught to zero. We will take our time to go through those to get there. Yes. Dr. Abu Sakara is an agroeconomist. I'm Stephen Enti. This is Hot Issues. When we return, we will talk about the practicality of changing things. Welcome back to Hot Issues. We're still discussing the agricultural sector and what needs to change so that we get better. Dr. Abu Sakara is still with me. Uh, so, Doc, you've spoken about quite a lot of things. You, I remember uh, you spoke about bringing the money in. It's all about cash investments. And one of the challenges that uh, agricultural sector investors have faced for decades is access to credit. You are not just a theoretical expert, you are a practicing farmer as well. How have you gone around the issues of uh, funding challenges? You see, having access to credit is one thing, but if you get access to credit that is very expensive, it can quickly put you into trouble. I found that out myself. And you wouldn't, be, you you wouldn't have done anything. Yeah. You would well, be going around you would have in made your situation worse. <laughs> but having said that, financial institutions are financial institutions. They're set up to make money, are you with me, and pay their shareholders. Yeah. We don't have any quarrel with that. And we go back to what I was saying, which is that policymakers must ensure that money leaks into agriculture, and that is by making it less appetizing for it to be leaking into keepish, you know, uh, uh, just uh, trading businesses uh, or uh, into just putting the money in a bank. And this must be yeah. intentional. Yes, it must be intentional. So it, because, frankly speaking, between you and me, if we were given a large sum of money and we could simply put that money in a bank and sit around and wait for 35% interest rate, etc., why on earth would we take it yeah. and go and risk it in an investment that at the maximum will not give us? Yeah that much, are you with me? And also, at the end of the day, has a lot of risks associated with it, no matter how much you work to reduce those risks. So clearly speaking, you know, we have to look at some kind of preferential window f to spare agricultural development for a certain period at our stage of development now. To say simply that, oh, let the private sector take care of it and, you know, let's have a hands-free, you know, abscond our duties. And that's, I don't think that is the right approach. Those people telling you that are not doing that themselves. I want to look at the courage and boldness yeah. in uh, competition. You, you've spoken about uh, competition, which brings to mind the, the competition from cheap imported products. Example, poultry and rice. How do we get around this problem? Uh, I know that there have been suggestions from the Ministry of Agriculture that mm -hmm. by 2022 there will be a total ban on rice importation, etc. Importers and exporters say they're not worried, but they're worried actually whether uh, the country as a whole can meet the gap of 400,000 or 300,000 or so between production and the quantities that we consume. How do we get around this? I think, first of all, your poultry has less to do with rice production than legume production because our legume production is very low. And legumes are primarily the bulk of what we use in the animal feed. 
uh, in this country because we eat peanuts and we eat uh, our beans. Mm -hmm. A soya bean which we don't eat, which you can treat it as an industrial crop. Mm -hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not indigenous to us, and we have to learn how to grow it. Uh, already, our research scientists have made uh, good progress. And uh, indeed, the ministry itself identified this as a key area that they need to do, which is to increase the, the, the soybean production. But the economics of it uh, doesn't work out immediately, and you need some interventions. First of all, the total yields for those uh, legumes are lower than for, say, cereals in terms of total output per unit area. Uh, now, when you look at the prices, even though they have slightly higher prices, if you go to the open market, the higher prices are not sufficient to justify you spending all your money and in increasing that in acreage. So it is only where you can get a premium price for them over and above what you would have, not just in total amount for the cereals, but to make up for the fact that they have these slightly lower yields and they're going to go into poultry feed, which is going to give you a leg up on competing in your meat industry and reducing the imports. That is a plan you have to work out with the uh, industry operators. And it's entirely possible. I've spoken to the uh, you know, Ghana Poultry Farmers Association at various times. I know their problems. Uh, I mean, they have energy uh, problems in terms of what they pay for electricity. You use a lot of energy mm -hmm. there. And again, why can't you have a rebate for them to make them competitive? They have problems in terms of the feed, but again, simply because they have to use imported feed and the local feed is not in sufficient quantity and sometimes not even in quality. But with increasing trends towards natural foods and organic yeah. foods, etc., we have a competitive niche here to produce meat that has been you know, fed on natural African grown products. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the purchasing power, you yeah. and me, to pay the premium on yeah. that. The people who have the purchasing power to pay the premium on that are the people who already live to 80 and they'd like to live up to, say, 100 in a good health. Uh, now, maybe you can do some kind of partial swapping, <laughs> some of it, export some of it to offset, you know, uh, your cost. Uh, your, your loss of op opportunity for income uh, in just using the cheaper product to, 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 to produce your, your meat. So there, there are ways in which we can look at this. But again, talk to the industry people, not just talk to them, they come, they listen to what they have to say, they all gather, their leader gives a speech to the president, they will wrap up the books and go home. No sit down with pencil and paper with the Minister of Finance and say, this is the price we can deliver it at. Let's work out. Let's go backwards from the market. Where and where and where can you help us? Are you with me? Now, we don't want to be cripples forever. We want to be competitive. But the global economy is an asymmetric global economy where we are in a position of weakness relative to other people. There's historical reasons for this and we don't want to go into colonialism and all of that. The reality is, here is where we are. Uh, we're, you know, trying to compete with people who have already developed well-grown muscles, yeah. you know. So we have to be also giving some exercise and giving feeding mm -hmm. to grow our muscles, to be able to compete and use different strategies, maybe compete with them in different kinds of games where we have a, a comparative advantage on our turf. Let's look at how to yeah. encourage the Ghanaian to yeah. develop appetite for uh, locally produced agricultural products. The fact that we're talking about Ghana-made rice itself is progress because people are not just blindly It's going a good to the first market. step. It's a good first step. I always believe in progress. Mm. You know, I think too many times we get caught up in condemnation, looking back and condemning, condemning. We can look forward and congratulate ourselves on our achievements and encourage ourselves to rise to the challenges in front of us. That doesn't mean that the challenges are not there. They're there and they're real. So for me, uh, this whole rice issue is good. I'm a, a seed producer in rice, you know, uh, and I've seen the impact that this has had just for the seed produced to get out to the districts. 
the government intervention was needed for that to go on. I mean, the fact that they don't pay all the seed producers yeah. is another thing. The fact they but owe you, for let's, let's, let's look at the big picture. <laughs> Forget about me. Let's look at the big picture. The big picture is that they've helped us get past this first step. Now, there are several other steps. One, let's mill it, good quality, package it attractively, and then conscientize our people to be able to look, give it a fair chance, mm. you know? Uh, and when you go around town, you see Rice Master, you know, uh, big, big billboards of all the imported rices. Yeah. When you look at your TV from time to time, you see my brother Sefeka eating rice and saying, hmm, mm. that's not the Ghana made rice. <laughs> <laughs> you and me. <laughs> so all these are advertisements. We could do the same for Ghana made money. rice. Now, we don't expect the poor farmers and millers to get together their money to come and incur this additional cost when they're already struggling with being competitive in the marketplace. This is a clear area where we can have interventions, sponsored interventions from government. I, I would resist the temptation to talk about politics, but you once <laughs> wanted to be a president of this country, but uh, you, you mentioned already that the, being the duopoly of NDC and PP, how will you see that change? And what is the level of your political involvement today? <laughs> that is now a very different question altogether. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, it is not a secret to most Ghanaians that since the Fourth Republic, the duopoly has entrenched itself. This happens, but when it happens in a democratic system where institutions are strong, there can still be check mechanisms to enable it to continue to evolve. But when it happens in systems where the institutions are weak, it can create this is, uh, what would I say, the phenomenon of a pituitary dwarf. In other words, your democracy flourishes but stops at a certain level you think and it doesn't go You think we're there. there now? I think that we need an intervention that will break that duopoly and force not just NDC, MPP, but all of us to think more creatively, more independently of the solutions that have been proffered so far. Because if those solutions were indeed what we're going to lift us from where we are now to be in a country with first world standards, mm. it would have happened. It hasn't happened and we are a long way off there. Now, that is not to say that if you look inside the progress, you cannot see some incremental progress here and there. And I think that we should stop doing that because it only you know, confuses the issue. If I were supposed to all travel from here to Bolga and it is now five years on and you and me have not even left the lorry station i can boast about being nearer the gates than you <laughs> you know uh, but really the question is where are we supposed to be mm. and i think those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves because those are the questions that then trigger us to start to collectively think more creatively about changing the fundamental framework within which we work both in terms of governance the economy and the society. And this is why in the national interest movement we have talked specifically about those things. So this national interest yeah, movement, yeah, your movement, a yeah. movement... Well, you, it's not my you, movement. You this is, a, is it a political yes, party? Yeah. No, it's not a political party. Uh, we deliberately did not want to make it a political party because I think uh, uh, too many people in Ghana associate political parties with something else. With wanting to be president? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, the quest for power and the privileges that come with it. Uh, what we are trying to get our youth to understand is that, you know, it is not a bad thing. So you won't be, be using that movement to no. nurture ambitions yes. to become president? No, no. I, what we're, there are specific things that movement is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing is to clearly show that without the constitutional changes and some significant strategic policy changes to restructure the framework for our development, we will peak at where we are and we will not go beyond there. The next thing is that we need to get them to change their mindset about what politics is about. Politics everywhere always has fringe benefits, but the fringe benefits are not the reason for its existence. And I think in a younger generation, we have a lot of work to do to switch people's minds off the benefits 
and look at the commitments and the services. And that means that we need to have more of a politics of conviction and less of a politics of convenience. You cannot have politicians of conviction when you practice politics of convenience. So against that backdrop, how do you assess the performance of this government? Well, I, I don't think that uh, backdrop needs the assessment of one government only. Mm. It needs the assessment of us as a people, of our democracy and where it is going. And in that sense, both this government and the previous government and all of us have been part of it. And we failed. Well, we have not made the critical progress that we need to be to even stand the chance of being where we want to. Are you hopeful that there could be a change, a driving force that will drive through real change? Oh, I think that if we begin to make the proper changes at the constitutional changes level... Changes in institution, changes in constitutional well, reforms? The, con the constitution comes Bringing before political the parties to the local the, level elections? Yeah, well, no, no. Uh, I think this significantly is one of the areas where we have stood very clearly apart from all the suggestions that are being made because we truly believe that the catalyst for this mindset change will come from realizing the right of the people to choose who they want at the local government level without necessary referring to the framework of parties. Because for our level of development, as soon as you introduce the framework of parties, people become blind to other options. And we need to recognize it. You see, there's no point in pretending you're holier than the Pope yeah. or you want to be more democratic than the Queen. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. We recognize us for what we do and insert those changes that take care of our weaknesses so that we can do the things differently. At the end of the day, if we do not prevent a system where this framework of parties even influences this simple decision at the district level of choosing who we want and on non-partisan basis, we will have a lot to pay for it. And I, I seriously do believe this and I mean this. Dr. Abu Sakara, thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, that's how we wrap up with Hot Issues. I'm Stephen Antti and I've had with me wonderful conversation with Dr. Abu Sakara, who is an agro-economist.